Hello and welcome to the Big Freeze Art Festival. I'm Charlotte Connolly and I'm the museum curator at the Polar Museum, which is part of the Scott Polar Research Institute. And today I'm joined by Andrew Lansley. Andrew was the 2019 Friends of Spry Antarctic Artist in Residence. Andrew, perhaps you can tell us a bit about yourself, the kind of art you do, and also why you applied for the residency. I was I was in a show at the Mal Galleries with the uh, Royal Society of Marine Artists, and because I was in that, I got an email, and I got the email, and I opened it, and I thought, oh, and I showed it to my wife, and she said. I've got chills about that you're definitely going I said okay so there was I don't think it was a presumption it was more of a just a feeling in my bones really I'd been interested in stories of polar exploration and we'd, we'd been to Norway and I'd, and uh, you know I'd got some experience of traveling in kind of remote and mountainous kind of uh, locations uh, and so this was kind of a fusion of something which was uh kind of imagined and reality um kind of happening i guess synchronicity is is a, is a way to explain it but it's not a rational thing so uh, there's a danger of sounding a little bit hubristic which i, I don't intend to at all because there was there's was no hubris in it but um it, i guess the short shortest way to describe that experience is it caught my imagination so it was really easy to write a letter of application um which I did, and you know, I, I told a story about why I thought I wanted to go. Um, then I got invited, and I think as I went down that process, you know, being invited for interview, it got kind of more surreal. And I think I actually, I think I remember telephoning you to say, oh, "I'm coming up to Cambridge just to check." It's like habeas corpus, and I remember you saying to me, "No, we are actually sending you to Antarctica." I don't know if you remember that. I don't actually know, but I'm glad that I was able uh, to confirm it for you. <laughs> yeah, you were. Yeah, you were. And um, yeah, so I, I I drove all the way across to um, Cambridge just to check that it wasn't a joke. And um, yeah, I came and I saw the museum and then I had to wait what is about a year because Nick Romerold was appointed on the same day and he bagged it the first trip, which is fair enough. So which was nice because that meant I had a, a, a year which, which didn't take me doesn't sound like a, a long time, it, it kind of passed quite quickly. Uh, and then before I knew it, I was off to Bryce Norton and getting on one of those big planes. And I was off down to Mount Pleasant on the Falklands. So yeah, the whole thing in that sense was, was a little bit surreal. So, um, but it was amazing. It was literally like a dream come true. So. So tell us what happened then after taking off from Bryce Norton. What, how did the experience unfold and what did you get up to? Yeah, well, we stopped off at um, Cape Verde, and um, which sounds exotic, but actually it was just a departure lounge and I was there for just a couple of hours while they refuel. And then I got to Mount Pleasant, which is, um, it's a barren, barren place. I mean, it's I'd, obviously I've never been to the Falklands before. Um, and I walked about and I took some photos there um, and I managed to uh, meet up with some of the locals. There's a couple that Nick introduced me to who were down in Stanley. And I also um, befriended the chaplain there, um, who's my, my father's a Methodist minister. So, so it was quite nice when I was down there on the Sunday, I thought I'll go to the chapel service, which is, I'm not a regular church goer, but actually that did feel quite comforting. It was quite home-like. And there were some lovely people there. And I met one of the guys um, from Protector there as well. And we stayed in touch. So uh, Mount Pleasant was, it was sort of five days of uh, kind of exploring, going for walks, looking at, at, at things. Um, I was quite surprised that um, to see turkey vultures down there, for example. Um, and just the various things like that. Uh, and then after about a week of, uh, being in the, uh, I, I say in the mess, I wasn't in a posh room, it was literally transit accommodation. So it was like, this is what you get if you're a cadet kind of thing. Although I was, obviously I ate in the mess and I could go in the officer's mess and I could go and sort of socialize in there if I want. So yeah, I mean, that, that, that passed quite happily that time. And then I was on the ship and I was given the two ICs cabin again, which is like, how did that happen? So I had a desk, I had a TV where I could watch, you know, forces TV if I wanted to. 
or anything else um and a separate kind of bunk room and shower room so it was all en suite so i was uh, as far as living on protector is concerned i was really given five star uh, accommodation mm -hmm. um, is that yeah. what you were expecting or how, how did it compare with your expectations I, I didn't really have any expectations um but everyone on the ship made me um made me quite welcome um and again i was allowed to socialize in the officer's mess which was very pleasant um so yeah it was it was it was a good time yeah and in terms of your experience of traveling to antarctica then do you remember the moment when you first kind of cast eyes on antarctica or are there any other memorable moments that really stick out for you oh crikey yeah um well we crossed the drake's passage um and that was really interesting. Um, so just to sort of digress slightly from answering your question about when I first saw the ice, but that that crossing. Um, now, you didn't tell me that the Drake's Passage was kind of the, one of the most turbulent seas in, in the world. Yeah, thanks for that. Heads up. Um, I was I was with a bunch of guys. We were in the um, in the canteen having a cold weather briefing from the Marines. And um, all of a sudden, the nose just pitched like this. All the all the teacups and tables and chairs crashed to the front and hit the front wall. Then guess what? It went up like that. And all of a sudden I'm sitting there and I've got teacups and everything flying right at me. The language coming out of the galley was quite fruity at that point. All the urns were ripped off the side and um, two or three people, I think, were spontaneously quite ill. I'd never seen that before. I, I ended up laughing. Um, and there was one poor girl, I think she actually filled the bin bag. So there we go. Yeah, it was quite dramatic, but things like that actually you remember and you think, wow, that was exciting. Mm -hmm. So- um, <laughs> Exciting yeah. isn't always a good thing, is it? <laughs> but I guess when you're at sea, stuff like that happens, but I've never been in anything like that before. So mm -hmm. it was, that was quite exciting. Yeah. Um, and then you, we emerged from the opposite, from the far side of Drake's Passage and all of a sudden the sea is quite glassy. Go, whoa. And exactly as I'd imagined, there was this rim of ice. I could see just this white strip. I thought, and it was exactly as I imagined it. Not only that, I'd even drawn it and painted it because that, you know, so this again was a meeting of imagination and actually, you know, a real lived experience. So I was at that moment, I think I was, I was stepping back into that kind of surreal mode thinking, crikey, here we go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then gradually we saw more and more, you know, pieces of ice, and then eventually we got to uh, King George Island, uh, and we moored up. We had to pick up a couple of um, scientists from the British Antarctic Survey who'd been marooned on that island for a little while, looking for evidence of dinosaurs or something. I don't know. But anyway, so that's what happened. Um, and that was, I guess, the official arrival in Antarctica. And we went around King George Island and then we went across to Deception Island. Again, something which I'd imagined. Um, and we sailed into the, um, the, 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 the middle of the crater. And there I was able to get off and walk about and um, shake hands with the sea lions and take some um, amazing photos of the old derelict buildings. And there were three, uh, three, uh, three graves there as well. I thought, crikey. You know, people really did live and die there. The old oil tanks, which had sunk into the ground. Um, ideal if you want to do like old dilapidated sheds and pictures like that. So yeah, I, I got some great photos there. Um, and then once we, we tend we to left, think of the polar regions yeah. as quite kind of pristine places. So it's interesting to hear of that industrial heritage that is still there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I imagine it's a bit, a little bit like that at Gritvik and um, I haven't been to Gritvik, but yeah, it was the evidence of, of the, the, the the whaling and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and obviously being quite sheltered within within the crater as well. So I remember when you came for your interview for the residency, you you showed us the work yeah. that you'd kind of done up to that point. And there were lots of really mm. uh, beautiful landscapes. And I seem to remember there were cliffs from around the British coastline. Yeah. How much of that kind of work fed into your trip to Antarctica and how much did the trip to Antarctica change what you then have worked on since? Well that's interesting because um, I, 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 I can work either 
in a very inductive way. In other words, I make it up and I don't have a plan at the start and just see where it takes me. Sometimes I see something that hits me. I think I've got to do that. And I might work literally from a photograph because the photo I think is so perfect. I might even grid it up and I might do a large kind of pencil drawing of, uh, you know, an iceberg or something like that. Um, but either way, th these these landscapes, they're, they're inhabiting uh, a big part of my imagination. So there's a fusion of kind of uh, fantasy and sort of documentary sort of going on. And I, I love it when those two things kind of collide because it makes me think, oh, yeah, I'm on the right track. So, um, yeah, some, some of these places are really site specific. Another thing that I've enjoyed doing in the past is if I've made something up, I think, that reminds me of somewhere and I'll even go on Google Earth and have a look and go, looks like that. I go, wow, it really does look like just, and I could title it like that. So I think for me, dreaming about a place um, is a big part of, you know, the, the, the power of the experience of actually visiting the real thing. Um, and now I guess I'm, I'm far enough on the other side of it now that even the lived experience itself is a bit like it was a dream, you know, um, because there's a sense in which sometimes if, if something is completely divested of all its fancy and there it is in all its boldness, it's like it becomes very mundane because it's right there. And I think the big appeal of going to Antarctica is so much because it is over there and it's a place that not many people go. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so unlike, obviously, walking around Chippenham, isn't it? You don't get many icebergs here. I mean, if I was living, you know, up in Greenland or something, it might be, you know, but I'm not. So yeah, it's, there's a there's a lot of um, yeah that sort of sense of otherness, and also I, I think that something if if a landscape looks right or feels right, it it does have a sense of kind of otherness about it, and it's inhabited by a kind of a ghost or a spirit, whether that's the absence of man or whether that's evidence of people having been there. I don't know. But it's a landscape which we inhabit as creatures. So I, I, I guess in a sense, I'm telling a story about that, not in words, not in a literal sense, but I hope, I'm hoping that that kind of narrative is communicated through the images. Um, so just to finish up then, the last thing I was going to ask about was just more about your kind of artistic technique. Um, again, I remember oh, yeah. from your interview that you sort of presented us with this, uh, was it egg tempera as your yeah medium is that what you were able to do on ship or with the cold temperatures and everything how did you end up working i well i like drawing so i did a fair bit of drawing um but i didn't draw very much outside the thing thing is in those cold temperatures working with watercolors or inks outdoors is impossible because the stuff doesn't dry you need a little bit of heat to uh, you know so i, I did a, a i did a lot of sketching and so forth in my cabin most of the time I was outdoors, I was taking photos and I was literally out there like 12 hours a day. I think I took about 5,000 pictures. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's, it's like an extreme case of FOMA. I was just afraid of missing anything. Um, but the other thing was that when I wasn't taking photos, I really was there just sucking the whole thing up um, and having that direct interface experience with the whole thing because you know a camera can only tell you so much it's very much again about what it feels like to be in that environment um and i think it takes a long time to process and, and unwrap that i can see myself working on this stuff for years and you know i'd love to go back I and mean, i'm planning on going i've got plans to go back to greenland if it wasn't for the lockdown i'd have already been back um say like the east coast um maybe someone like disco bay or someone like that um because I think, you know, repetition of these experiences is good as well. It kind of cements these things. And obviously the Arctic is more accessible for me than Antarctica. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I, I see it as an ongoing thing and I'm still processing that, that imagery, yeah. So then just to wrap up, perhaps you can tell us a bit about what we can look forward to over the next uh, months and years. Is there anything we should be keeping our eyes peeled for? Uh, I, I had a, a, a show to some of the polar work um, last summer, and that was a, a very successful exhibition. I'm hoping to do another show, um, all being well, with Nick Jones and with Nick Romerill um, in September coming mm -hmm. up. So um, that work will be brand new. Um, so, yes, watch this space. There will, there will be more 
sort of polar work coming from my studio within the next six months. Well, I'm sure everyone who's watching at home will be uh, really pleased to see that come about. And I'm certainly looking forward to it from my, my seat in the Polar Museum as well. Um, so thank, thank you, very, you much. very much for joining me today. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for asking me. Thank you.